A beautiful Resurrection Sunday morning to all of you. Can you say to the person beside you, Jesus is risen. That's why I'm alive. Amen. Okay. You know, the celebration of Resurrection is done every year as part of the Lenten season. Of course, the celebration of Lent is something we have adopted from the Roman Catholic Church uh, religious calendar. Okay? And uh, it is good to remember you know, those important, those major events that really, you know, change history forever. The death and the resurrection of Christ. And what he did there also changed our lives. When he came in contact with Jesus and he became our Savior and Lord. And because this is an annual celebration, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that Jesus commanded us to remember what he did on the cross, not just once a year, but every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. So we are being commanded by Christ not just to remember his death and resurrection once a year, but every time we gather together as his people and we celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, we commemorate and remember what he did for us and what are the benefits for us. Amen? Also, a little just advice. Let's try to avoid calling this day Easter Sunday <laughs> because Easter actually is a confusion. Yeah, it's, uh, Easter is a uh, European spring goddess. Her name was Yostre. The, spring, the goddess of spring in Europe, okay? It's a long history. I will not discuss that today. But it, in time, it got confused with the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. Easter is more known for the Easter bunny, Easter eggs. It has nothing to do whatsoever with the resurrection of Christ. No connection whatsoever, okay? These two are confused in history. Until now, the tradition has been going on. So we call this Resurrection Sunday, not Easter, okay? So let's get used to that because children get confused when they hear the TV, Easter Bunny, oh, Easter Bunny, or oh, Easter Egg, or oh, is that the celebration today? No, the celebration is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not Easter Bunnies or Easter Eggs, amen? Okay, so let's try to teach our children this is the resurrection, celebration of the resurrection of Christ, nothing to do with bunnies and eggs, okay? So let's teach them the truth, okay? It's a confusion, okay? And later on in time, I may give a, a time to explain partly the history, how those two got confused, okay? Amen. So the Lord wants us to remember what he has done for us on the cross. And if you would like to summarize the meaning of the death of Christ and his resurrection, it can be summarized in one of the seven last words of Jesus, particularly the sixth word, which is, it is finished. And that's what we're going to focus on today. What is the meaning of it is finished? And how does that relate to the meaning of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Okay? You know, every Good Friday, we see people in our country bearing crosses, right? And allowing themselves to be nailed on the tree. And usually they do that out of panata or a promise, a commitment, like a vow, okay? That every year they will pay for their sins by allowing themselves to carry the cross and be crucified. I mean, literally, they, they have a nail driven right into their palm, okay? It takes a year to heal, okay? And they do that every year because of a vow they made because they believe that what they do is paying for their sins, okay? And every year they have to pay for their sins, okay? And that is a real misconception because our sins can never be paid for by our own sacrifices, okay? Because according to the Word of God, God's sentence against sin is death. And that means real death, not mock death. Okay, they understand that. And death in the Bible means separation from God. Not only separation, but eternal separation from God. In the place of punishment we call hell. That is the consequence of our sin. And that is why we can never save ourselves from our sin by anything we do because we still continue to sin. Okay? So that is why we would like to understand what Jesus meant when he said, it is finished. So can you say to the person beside you, it is finished, not to be continued. Okay? So what is the meaning of it is finished? In fact, the word in Greek, 
that has been recorded in the Gospels because the, the New Testament was written in the Greek language is the Greek word tetelestai. Can you say the tetelestai? Which comes from the Greek verb teleo, which means to complete, to finish, or to say, to put an end. Okay? So when Jesus cried out tetelestai, that means it has been completed, finished. It has been put to an end. What has been put to an end? The punishment of our sins. Okay? In fact, in the early, in the first century, because teleo is a Greek word, they often write tetelestai whenever a death, somebody has a death. And when you pay your debtor, the full of, full of your debt, your debtor will write on the piece of uh, parchment, tetelestai, which means it has been paid in full. That means you do not owe him anymore. Because once those words are written across the, you know, they use parchment for paper, tetelestai, I mean all the debts are listed there are now canceled because it has already been paid in full. That's why the commercial meaning of teleo, especially tetelestai, means it has been fully paid. It means there's no more debt. Do you understand that? So that is the, the commercial uh, meaning of the word that Jesus uttered from the cross. Of course, his original language was not Greek. Jesus spoke in Aramaic, okay? But the translation in Greek is this word, tetelestai. So what does it is finished mean? It has been paid in full. So once something has been paid in full, you have no right anymore to collect or to charge a person, you know, payment for a debt because all the debts have already been paid. Amen? So it is finished. Let's take a look at the Word of God. So here we are. The Word of God says, unlike the other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. You know, the, in the Old Testament, they had a sacrificial system and they were priests offering sacrifices every day on behalf of the people. And these were called sin offerings, okay? Usually it's an animal that would be killed and the shedding of blood means death has taken place, which means that the animal represents the one offering that when the animal is killed in the eyes of God, the one who offered has already paid the death penalty. So in other words, the animal represents the one offering. That's why before the animal is killed, the one offering will place his hand over the head of the animal to signify a transfer of identity. Do you understand that? Transfer of identity. So when that animal is killed in the eyes of God, that man has already died. Okay? But the animal is the one representing him. Okay? And so because death has already been carried out, now God forgives sins. In other words, you cannot be forgiven until you pay the penalty of death. The problem is that if tayo yung namatay, wala tayo pag-asa. You'll be forever lost. You understand that? That's why God provided a substitute. An animal dies on your behalf and God takes that as your death. You paid for your sin and therefore now He forgives. In other words, God cannot forgive until the death has been paid. You understand that? Okay? That's why in, in the book of Hebrews, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. The shedding of blood must take place. Death must be uh, executed so that God can forgive you. Do you understand this? Okay? And so if they were the ones who suffered that death, we're hopeless. That's the end. Amen? That's why God provided a substitute. And those animals that were sacrificed by the priests in the Old Testament were also offered on behalf of the sins of the priests. See, he's offering that on behalf of the people, but he's also offering a sacrifice for his own sins because he also sins. And then he offers a sacrifice for the sins of the people so that God will forgive them because the priest there is not perfect. He also sins. Do you understand that? That's why the author of the is saying, unlike the other high priest, you know the high priest, right? He's the head of the Sanhedrin. Can we say Sanhedrin? The Sanhedrin is the highest religious court in Israel. It's, co it's, it's comparable to our Supreme Court, but it's a religious court. All the, the justice system of Israel in ancient times is based on the Mosaic law. It's a religious court. Do you understand that? And the high priest presides over the Sanhedrin every time there are cases brought to the Sanhedrin, whether it's a doctrinal case or a case of somebody who has violated the law. 
Okay? So the high priest had high authority, and he is privileged once a year. Can we say once a year? Once a year, the high priest is given the privilege and responsibility to enter the most holy place in the, in the temple. You know, the temple has two compartments. The holy place, that's where we find the altar of, golden altar of incense, which is fronting the curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be found. You understand that? So nobody enters the most holy place except the high priest. Nobody. Okay? So there we have the altar. Then on the left, you will have the seven uh, branch golden lampstand. This represents, of course, what? The presence of God among his people. And then there's a table on the right side with every day is replenished with 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel present before God. Do you understand this? Okay? And so the altar of incense is the prayer where they offer prayers. The incense, when it is burned, represents the prayers going up to God. And it always faces that curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place where the Ark of Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant rests. The most sacred relic to Israel is the Ark of the Covenant. Because it represents the throne of God on earth. You understand that? Can they say that the Ark of the Covenant represents the throne of God on earth. And the high priest enters the most holy place in order to atone for the sins of all the people waiting outside. He will take from the blood of the bull, a bull has been killed outside at the altar of sacrifice. He will take the blood of the bull in a, in a, in a container and then he will go towards the, most, the curtain and then he will go like this, he will have to go inside backwards. Okay? Because this is an expression of what? Respect and honor. Um, because you recognize you're a man entering to the presence of God, you have to go backwards. And then once he goes backwards and enters the bed carrying the blood, he will then take from the blood and sprinkle the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. The cover is made of pure gold. It's called the Kippureth, okay? And that cover, remember, there are symbols of two cherubim with their wings touching one another. That covering, the Kippureth, is the place where the blood is sprinkled, okay? And when the blood is sprinkled and God sees the blood, he now forgives all the sins of the people worshiping outside, including the sins of the high priest. Do you understand that? So the priest does that every year. And here we find, unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer side day after day, for, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because Jesus, the one who came to fulfill the role of the high priest, offers himself, not a bull. He becomes the sacrifice. And he offers himself for our sins, for the sins of the people, once and for all. Do you understand? Can we say once and for all? Okay. Because it cannot be repeated because what Jesus offered is already complete in itself. Can we say that? Complete in itself. There's nothing we can add to what Jesus did, okay? That's why it is once and for all time. That's why he said, it is finished. In Hebrews 9.12, can we read this together? He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, unlike the high priest on earth, but he entered the most holy place that is heaven, because the most holy place on earth represents heaven, okay? Once for all, by his own blood, not the blood of an animal, by his own blood, thus obtaining for us eternal redemption, okay? The effects of Jesus' sacrifice is eternal. Can we say that eternal? That means if even if you live forever and you sin every day, the blood of Christ is enough to cover your sins forever. Do you understand this? But praise God, we don't sin forever because we die physically. Praise God, there is an end to sin, okay? But the blood of Christ, offered once and for all, covers all those sins. In other words, when you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you trusted Him as your Savior, all your sins, past, present, and future, have already been paid for. Do you understand that? But it's another thing to receive forgiveness, because forgiveness is conditioned on your confession. Okay, we will talk more about that in a little while. Okay, so let's read this again. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood that is not his own. 
Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once and for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen? Is there anything you can add to what Jesus has already done for you for all your sins? Can you add more sacrifice to what he has already sacrificed for you once and for all time? Amen? Here's another scripture in Hebrews. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. Ref talking to his father. He sets aside the first covenant the covenant under Moses, which is based on the law, okay? And the covenant, the second covenant, which is based on the shed blood of Christ, the death of Christ for us. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. I mean, how many times have you heard this repeated again and again? Once and for all. Nothing you can add to that, okay? Here's another one. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, because those sins simply are representative. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ, when he came, he offered for all time one sacrifice, his own body, his own life for us. Only one sacrifice, and then he sat down at the right hand of God. Can you say he sat down? You know what that means? That means his mission was fully accomplished. When a, when, a, when a warrior and a king fights a battle and he wins a victory, he goes back, you know, and he sits down, you know, on the, sorry, when a commander goes out in battle and wins a victory for the king, when he comes back, the king will honor him for his victory by letting him sit at his right hand. That means you've done a great job. You have, you are victorious. That means mission accomplished. So for you to sit down at the hand of God, right, this means you're already being honored for something you have accomplished in terms of your mission. Jesus finished the job. Amen? There's nothing more we can add to that. And for, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect. Perfect here in Hebrews means acceptable to God. Can you ask you a question? Whenever you come to God to pray, do you tend to feel that you are not worthy to enter his presence because you know you have done so many sins? You don't feel worthy, right? You feel like, will God hear me? You know, I'm so full of sin. I committed a lot of sin today. Will God accept me? Will God accept you? Let me ask you a question. When the prodigal son returned to his father, he had the wrong reasons for coming back. He did not come back because he realized he offended his father. He did not come back because he realized, you know, he has done great damage to his father's name by what he did. No, he came back because he was hungry. And because there was no more food where he was, because there was a famine, and he lost all his money, all his inheritance, he threw away in wild living. And now he's penniless, and because... He's so hungry, he remembers that the servants in his father's house eat a lot. And here, a son, the son, is not eating anything. He said, I'll go back to my dad. Why? Because he wants to eat. <laughs> the motive even is wrong. You understand that? He's going back remorseful because he's now suffering the consequences of his wrong choice. Right? He's suffering the effects of his wrong decision. And now he wants to go back because he wants to survive. He needs to eat food. That's the only reason why he comes back. Did he feel sorry that he hurt his father? Did he feel sorry that he dishonored his father? No. Did he realize that his, you know, what he did to his father was very serious? Well, he did say, I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So does he recognize his sin? That what was the reason why he was coming back? Because he was hungry, right? Are you confessing your sins to God simply because you want, don't want to be deprived of his blessings? Do you go back to God and ask his forgiveness for Jesus because you don't want to be deprived of his blessings. 
Or are you returning to your father? Because you know what you did was so unfair to offend the one who has given everything to you. He does not deserve that. Are you coming back to God because you love him? Are you coming back to God because you feel sorry that you have, you know, offended somebody who does not deserve it? Or are you coming back because you want to find release from your guilt? You don't have to live anymore in the guilty feeling. You just want to get rid of the guilt and come back, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm asking sorry because I feel guilty and I have to get rid of it. Is that why you come back to God? But let me tell you the point of the story of the prodigal son. In the eyes of the father, regardless of your motivation, the fact that you're coming back to him is good enough reason for him to accept you. Do you understand this? And you know why he's doing this? Because as Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, don't you know that this kindness is meant to lead you to the real repentance. Are you saying this? See, kindness in the New Testament is a very uh, technical word, prautes in Greek, which means kindness shown to an offender. When the Bible uses the word kindness, that's not like our, you know, human kindness, or oh, can I help you? Uh, can I assist you? You know, we're being kind, right? You want to help another person? No. Biblical kindness is always directed to somebody who has hurt and offended you. That's why in the Bible, kindness is not just a, uh, uh, you know, a cultural trait. It's an expression of strength, of character. It's a virtue. Kindness in the Bible is a virtue. Because it takes a lot of character to be kind to somebody who has offended you. And that's why the Word of God says in Romans 2, 4, God's kindness, that means to one body who offended him, is being kind to you, is meant to lead you to repentance. You understand this? That's why the story of the prodigal son, the father accepted him regardless of his wrong motives. Because he came back. And because he's back to his father's, you know, house, he'll be able to lead him to genuine repentance. Amen? You understand this? Now, how do you conscientize people? How do we conscientize people? Nangonconscientia. Right? We try to sermonize, you know, make them realize how wrong they are, you know, how bad they are, right? How does God conscientize us? By being kind to us. Amen? The song says, killing you softly with his love. Amen? That is why the Word of God commands us in Romans 12, 12, when your enemy is hungry, that's verse 20, give him something to drink. Uh, Fool it when he is thirsty, give him something to drink. You show kindness to the one who offended you. And that is what God shows us. He remains kind to us even when we come back with the wrong motive. Because God accepts you not because you are good, not because you, are, you had a, a past good record of serving God or doing good things for God, but somehow, you know, you sin and you fall, and therefore you come back and say, God, I'm sorry. Please accept me. God does not accept you because you were good. God does not accept you because of your past performance. God accepts you for one reason only. Because you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. He accepts you on the basis of Jesus' finished work on the cross on your behalf. You understand this? God will never accept you if you come to him on the basis of your own righteousness or merits because our righteousness is never enough because we still sin. The kind of righteousness that God desires is sinless righteousness. The kind of holiness that God requires is sinless holiness. Question, who of us is sinlessly righteous? That's why our righteousness will never make us acceptable to God. It is only what Jesus did on the cross. It is finished. That makes us acceptable. When you appeal to the cross, the Father cannot reject you. 
and you come to God through Jesus Christ, the Father cannot reject you because Jesus paid for all those sins. And he has the power and the authority to bring you to his Father and receive forgiveness. This is what Jesus did for you and me. Amen? Somebody told me, Pastor, but you know, sometimes I don't feel worthy coming to God. Let me ask you this question. When were you ever worthy? Anybody here can claim, oh, Pastor, I, there was a time I was really worthy to come to God. When were you ever worthy for God to accept you? You understand this? There's never been a time, it will never be a time in our life that in ourselves, in our own righteousness, we have ever been worthy. Jesus made you worthy by his blood. You remember that? Jesus made you worthy by that one sacrifice for all time, and you cannot add anything to that because it is finished. The assurance of our salvation is based on the finished work of Christ, not our daily performance of righteousness. Amen? Amen? I will say glory, hallelujah, after hearing that. Amen? What a release. So, what is the meaning, therefore, of the resurrection of Christ? Here's the meaning of the resurrection. Christ's resurrection and exaltation to glory was the Father's vindication of the holiness of His Son. You see, Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, became a sinner. Can we say that? Became a sinner. When He shouted on that cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He can no longer call God His Father. In the first of the seven last words, what's the first of the seven last words? Can you say loud the first of the seven last words? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Okay? You don't remember the sequence, right? <laughs> what was the seventh, the last of the seven last words? Father, again. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. This is the sixth last word. It is finished. Just before the seventh. Okay? So I hope you still remember the sequence, right? So the first last word, he calls God Father. The last last word, he calls God Father. But in the middle, he calls God, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The longer Father. You know why? You know why he can no longer call God Father at that moment? That was at the moment when, according to the Gospels, there was darkness all over the land. From 12 noon, he hung there from 9 a.m. up to 3 p.m. He gave up his spirit at 3 p.m. But from 9 to 3, 9 to 12, there was still light. But from 12 noon up to 3 p.m., there was total darkness in the land. It was during that darkness that Christ cried out, Eloi, Eloi, in Aramaic, the original tongue of Christ, Lama Sabachthani. Why have you forsaken me? Why does he call his father God instead of father? Because at that moment in time, the father laid all our sins upon him and he became the sinner for all of us. And he took our sin. He represented us at that moment. He became our substitute. And because he represented all sinners, the Father now separates from him. Because remember, the penalty of sin is death, which is separation from God. And on that moment, in that moment of darkness, it was a God the Father was trying to show his son, Son, I have put darkness all over. Because this is the moment I will severe my fellowship with you. That fellowship between Father and Son, Jesus enjoyed that from eternity past. But in one single moment of time on earth, He will have to sacrifice that intimate fellowship with His Father. So He will suffer the punishment that we deserve, separation from God. That's why He called God, not Father, my God, because He's now a sinner 
crying out to God for mercy. No longer a son of God crying out to his father because now he's representing all of us. He's taken upon himself all our sins and the father saw all our sins on him and he had to separate himself. That was the most painful moment in the life of the eternal son of God. That is what he was afraid of when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was not afraid of the physical suffering. He was ready for that. But he could not accept that because of our sins, that fellowship with his Father has to be temporarily be cut off. And that's what made him tremble. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. He just cannot accept. You understand what this is saying? That's how death took place. His physical death represented our physical death, which is part of the punishment of sin. His separation from his father represented our spiritual death, our separation from God because of sin. Now Jesus has to suffer that. Both physical and spiritual separation. Physical and spiritual death for you and me. And he anguished and agonized over the prospect of that before he came to the cross. And Jesus sacrificed that. So he could become the sinner that God now cuts fellowship from and says, separate. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want you to know how much it cost Jesus. Not just the, you know, many movies depict the passion of Christ. They think that the real suffering of Christ is the physical pain that he had to endure, the flogging, you know, the carrying of the cross, the crown of thorns, you know. People think that the heart of the suffering of the passion of Christ are those physical experiences of pain. No. Jesus was prepared for that. What he was scared about is the spiritual death that will take place. Something so hard for him to give up. But he did it for his father and for you. You understand that? And he did that only once and for all. You know once and for all. He wants to know why his one sacrifice affects all time. You want to know? You know why? Because Jesus Christ, although he took human flesh, was still the eternal son of God. He was God-man, not 50% God, 50% man. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. He had to become man to represent us. Because it was man who sinned, therefore man is the one must be, that must be punished, right? Because man sinned, man must be punished. You cannot punish God for man's sin. You got that? So he had to become man to properly represent us. And he dies on that cross, first as a man representing us, but secondly, because he is also deity, is God. That suffering he endured, therefore, has infinite consequences. Because he is an infinite being in human flesh. If Jesus was just a man, his death would have no effect for, over us. But because he was also God, an infinite being, the effects of his sacrifice is infinite that's why once and for all time because it took the eternal son of god to effectively make that kind of sacrifice no man can do that for us only jesus christ do you understand this okay that is why that's such great cause for him the father had to vindicate him after becoming the sinner on the cross the father in his heart you know his heart was rent you can imagine the, the pain. It's not just the Son of God suffering. The heart of the Father was in anguish and he had to separate from his Son. Severe fellowship. Cut that fellowship because now he's the sinner. It hurt the Father. It hurt Jesus. And they carried that hurt because they love you and me. You understand this? And listen to this. The Father had to vindicate his Son. That's why on the third day, 
God the Father did not allow the body of His Son, Jesus, to undergo decay. You know why? Because physical death being the effect of sin means that your body will return to the dust, right? That was the punishment given by God. You are dust and to dust you shall return. Because man is a sinner. All of him will return to dust. But because Jesus was also the Holy Son of God, and he was just a substitute for us. After he finished his work, it is finished. His role as a sinner on our behalf is now finished also. As a sinner, he suffered the eternal punishment he deserved. That momentary separation from his father had infinite effect on him because he was the eternal son of God. Now listen to this. But after he finished his work, the Father now vindicates him. You are my holy son. And I will not allow your body to undergo decay because you have finished your work already. Now, I will raise you up and not let you decay. Do you understand this? Now listen to this. The resurrection, I'll show you the scriptures in a while, okay? I'm just giving a summary right now. And the testimony, the resurrection of Christ is the testimony that the Father has accepted the once-for-all substitutionary sacrifice of His Son on the cross for our sins as effectual for all ages. By raising Christ to the dead, He's saying, Son, you've done it. Now I'm restoring back your dignity. I will declare you my holy Son of God. I accept now the once and for all sacrifice you offered to be effective forever. Amen? It was the Father saying, Son, Son, I'm proud of you. You did it. Because of what you've done, now we are providing all humanity the hope of salvation. And now I will vindicate you. I will raise you up because you are my holy son. And death cannot stay with you. Death cannot stay with you. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's look at the scriptures. God raised him from the dead so that we will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. God was now vindicating Jesus after his finished work. Do you understand this? The second here, regarding his son, who as, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power. Can we say declared with power? To be the son of God. How was he declared by, with power to be the Son of God who is holy. How? By? By? The resurrection, by His resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is a demonstration that He is now being declared by power. He is my Son and He is holy. You understand that? It is a vindication of the holiness of Christ, which he had to sacrifice when he took our place and became the sinner for us. Amen? And listen to this. Can we read this? But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Not only the resurrection of Christ vindicates him and shows that the Father accepted the sacrifice for all of us, his exaltation at the right hand of God, listen to this, his exaltation at the right hand of God is a testimony that his sacrifice has been completely accepted by the Father. He's now being honored by the Father at his right hand for mission accomplished. You understand that? Now, let's go on. The second reason or meaning of the resurrection of Christ is this. The resurrection of Christ provides us the assurance that He will also raise us from the dead to complete our salvation because of our union with Him and His gift of the Holy Spirit to us. Amen? Because Jesus rose from the dead, that means you will one day rise from the dead. Amen? Because He represented us, even His resurrection. Okay? And that's why whatever Jesus went through, we will go through and we have gone through. When you come to Christ, the Father sees you as having died for your sins in Christ. Therefore, God forgives you and God accepts you. But because you're also united in, in Christ, His resurrection looks forward to your resurrection. Amen? 
which means if you have loved ones of God ahead in the Lord and they are believers one day we will see them again amen how many of you have loved ones of God ahead and you know they are Christians and have Christ in their lives can you raise your hands please I made that too when he passed away I thought I was not going to cry because I had such strong faith I knew one day I will see him again I love him very much I was his favorite son <laughs> and I loved him and I said I'm not going to cry at the burial because I know he's alive he's alive yet in another place and one day I will see him again but you know when that casket was being lowered to the earth I was surprised to find myself sobbing sobbing uncontrollably I said what's going on with me you may have all the faith but the physical connection the physical connection is that something that you easily get over with there will be pain there will be grief because of the physical separation amen but what gives you comfort is that one day you will see him because Jesus rose from the dead we will all rise from the dead amen hallelujah here it is the scriptures and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you how many have the Holy Spirit living in you the Word of God says you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of all your sins okay you're given the gift of the Spirit the Holy Spirit who lives in you he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit well this is on the day of resurrection the same spirit that was with Jesus will raise you from the dead amen and here's another scripture and you were also included or united to Christ before you were separate from Christ but you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation when you believe how many of you believe in Jesus as your Savior in raise your hands please when you believe Paul writes you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption that are being redeemed physically one day of those who are God's possession we are God's possession for the praise of his glory so what is this saying the moment you believe you receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in your life is God's guarantee amen that one day you will be with him it's like an engagement ring okay and you say to the person beside you engagement ring the only point where the analogy fails is that in our experience engagements can be broken right <laughs> but not with God the Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring that promises that one day we will be together forever that's the Holy Spirit in fact the word here deposit is a commercial term okay you know what do you do why do you give a deposit how many of you have been you know get into a loan over something you put like a car loan right you put a deposit right what's the what's the meaning of the deposit what's the purpose of the deposit it is the assurance they're giving assurance that I will pay the rest okay the Holy Spirit that you receive is God's deposit guaranteeing that one day you will receive your inheritance with Christ when you are risen from the dead you understand this okay so the Holy Spirit Christ gives us the assurance of our resurrection okay and this is also important I usually share this during a funeral service well we're not having a funeral service today amen but can we read this together Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even though he dies that's physical death and whoever lives and believes in me will never die that spiritual life do you believe in this now there are two levels here he's talking about physical life and he's talking about the life of the soul the first phrase refers to the physical life okay he who believes in me will live even though he dies the physical body will die amen amen it's hard to say amen to that right I'm gonna die one day <laughs> the physical body will die but because of your faith in Christ because he is the resurrection he will bring life to your body again amen resurrect you but the second line refers to the life of the soul but whoever lives 
and believes in me will never die. Is that physical death? Of course, everybody dies. Christ died. The apostles died physically. Everybody dies physically. But why does God say, He will never die? What is that referring to? What that never dies because of Jesus? Your soul lives on forever. In other words, you, your soul is your personality. You never die. Because of Christ. You just transferred in a diff to a different mode of life. But you're still you and you're still very much alive. Are you still here? Who wants never, who, who, who of you wants never to die? Amen. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you will die physically. And your soul will be eternally separated from Christ on the day of judgment. But if you have Christ in your life, you may die physically, but your soul lives on forever with him. Amen? You never die. That's why when somebody, a loved one, goes ahead, passes away, and he's a believer in Christ, that person is not dead according to Jesus. Your loved one is not dead. Your loved one just transferred to a different mode of life. But your loved one is very much alive, but he's not here on earth. He's now with the Lord, not here on earth. You understand this? So don't think that your loved one is just going around. That is a deception and a lie because that goes against the teaching of Christ. When you pass away, you go to be with the Lord forever. Not here, not on planet earth. Do you understand this? Okay. Do you believe this? Amen. Can you say to the person beside you, I am immortal in my soul but mortal in my body okay amen here's another one the third reason the meaning of the resurrection this is where many of you are going to be blessed the resurrection and the exaltation of christ is preparatory can we say preparatory to his work of education and intercession for his people to ensure their final salvation. The reason why Jesus sat down at the right hand of God is because he will start from the continue to intercede for us. Every time we sin, he intercedes for us. Amen? Every time you sin, when you are in Christ, Jesus comes to your defense even before you acknowledge your sin. Even before you repent, even before you ask forgiveness, Jesus is already interceding for you. Because you trusted him as your savior, he will always cover you for the rest of your life because he is your savior you understand it every time you sin jesus moves to your defense all the time he can never be against you because he gave his life for that sin that you committed and he will defend you before the father and receive forgiveness for your sin because that sin has been paid for are you still here amen that's the assurance of our salvation let's take a look at the scriptures Therefore, he is able, can we read this together? Therefore, he is able to save. So do we need to add to what Jesus can do? Do we need to add? Lord, I offer the sacrifice to pay for my sins. Lord, I offer the sacrifice so that you can forgive me. Do you have to offer a sacrifice for your sin, for your God for the give you, when Jesus already said, it is finished? Are we still here? He paid it all. Okay? He saved completely those who come to God. Why can He save you completely? Why can He be assured that you'll be with Him forever, even though you sin? Because He always lives. You see, that's why He had to rise from the dead. He had to rise from the dead to, so as He can be an eternal intercessor for us. So that He ensures that what He did on the cross will always be applied to you all the time. And that is what his intercession does. He always lives to intercede for them. Because he always lives into them, he can save them completely. Are you still here? That's why he had to rise from the dead. And here's the reason why he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Can Jesus condemn you when you sin? He cannot. Why cannot Jesus condemn you when you sin? Because he was the one who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. 
How can somebody who is always pleading your case all the time before the Father, how can somebody who is always defending you in court every time you sin, even before you appear in the court, is already defending you? How can that person condemn you? Amen? Because He is your Savior. The moment you entrust your life to Him, He will watch over you and protect you and defend you every time you sin. Because His death paid it all. Once and for all time. Are you still here? Can you love Jesus for the sacrifice He made for you? Can you love Him? Because all that, that's all that He wants. That's all that the Father wants. Love me. Because I think I deserve your love for all that I've done for you. You understand this? How many of you love the Lord Jesus? You should. It is commanded to love Him. But it also expresses our gratitude, our indebtedness to love Him for what He has done. Amen? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. Why is it that Christ alone can be the one mediator? Because he gave himself as a ransom for all people. He was the one who paid for our sins. That's why only he has the right to mediate for us. Nobody else has the right to mediate for us. I'm going to share something out of love. And I'm speaking as a former Catholic seminarian. And I entered the seminary in high school, the Catholic seminary. And by the grace of God, I was the one... Two of us were the top students in our class. I asked my teachers who were priests the real difficult questions because many of them find it hard to answer. I left the seminary because I wanted to find the truth. I was not satisfied with the answers I got from my teachers. I was always in the library of our seminary almost every day. Many times I closed the library. I invested a lot of time of research into the history of the church. And I learned a lot. That's why I, when I asked my teachers, they're not easy questions. I grew up in the intellectual climate of Bacolod City. I am Ilongo by birth, but Tagalog by blood. And in, 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 in Bacolod, there is an intellectual climate. The elite there are intellectuals. And later on, I thought I was part of the intellectual elite. My family was rich. My family, father was the manager of a pawn shop in Bacolod City. And I was part of the elite. And I've studied a lot about my religion. But I found all the answers to my questions in the Bible. And I repeat that. I found the answer to many of my questions that could not be answered in seminary when I started studying the scriptures. Every question in my heart, one by one, was answered by the word of God, not by the words of men. You understand this, okay? And I'm telling you, I love Catholics. In fact, one of my closest friends in Bacolod City is the mother superior of the Carmelite order in Bacolod City. And every time I go there, I visit her and we chat. Of course, I shared the gospel with her, and she always assures me, you know, my little brother, he always calls me my little brother, I assure you, Christ alone is my Savior. That's enough. <laughs> okay, I will tell stories about what God has done in my life. He will tell me what happened. He was just a nun, one of the nuns, when I got to know her, because my parents, because I was the black sheep of the family, my parents were so worried about me, they asked the nuns to pray for me. Every Sunday when we go to Mass at the Carmelite Church, my parents would bring, always bring me to that nun, so that nun will pray over me, counsel me, guide me, because I was the black sheep. Okay? And later on, of course, God led me on a journey to find Christ. Okay? The Christ of the Gospel, the Christ of the Scriptures. Later on, when I visited her, she was already a mother superior. Wow! I salute you, the big sister. <laughs> I want you to know until today, we have a very close relationship. And I respect her, I love her, 
because she has been my spiritual mentor and guide through the stormy years when I was the rebel in the family. And I know God heard her prayers when I came to Jesus Christ. Amen? So, that's why I feel very comfortable with the Catholic Church. And so when I was reading the scriptures and reviewing my understanding of my Catholic faith, I came to a point where I had to make a choice. I decided to align with the historic Christian faith represented in the scriptures. Because this is the original Christianity as we read it in the Gospels, written by the great apostles. I said I decided to stick with the original Christianity of the New Testament that declares that Christ alone is advocate, Christ alone is intercessor, Christ alone is mediator. Nobody can take those roles because only Jesus gave his life so he has the right to be our intercessor, our advocate, and our mediator. Do you understand this? Okay? So, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Can you say to the person, but God, God's will for you is for you to stop sinning. Okay? Because if you go on sinning, there will be consequences, which means discipline will take place. Can they say discipline? And the Bible says in Hebrews 12, those whom I love, I discipline. So when the Father disciplines you, that's not because he has rejected you, not because you have lost your salvation, he's disciplining you because he loves you and he's preparing you for heaven by teaching you to be holy. Do you understand this? Okay? You know, as a, a renewed Catholic, a renewed Christian, I will never allow anyone to take the glory of Christ that scripture has accorded to him. My one advocate, my one mediator, my one intercessor, because he was the one who died for me. Only Christ has the right to be my advocate. You understand this? Okay? So, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The reason why he can mediate for us, you know the word advocate, you know what it means? It means in the Greek, defense lawyer. Can we say defense lawyer? So what does the defense lawyer do when you're done something wrong? He defends you in court and appeals for your acquittal, right? That's what Jesus does. Every time you see it, Jesus moves before the Father, say, Father, forgive him. I paid for that sin. And the Father, of course, will say, being just, because sin has been paid for, he will be unjust if he demands punishment for sin for which Jesus was already punished for. They say he will be just enough to forgive, as the Scripture promises, because Jesus Christ has interceded for you. Amen? By the time you come to God to confess your sins, forgiveness is already available because Jesus already interceded for you. Are you still here? That's why you always have the assurance of forgiveness because Jesus' death paid your death already, paid your, your penalty. That's why you cannot be punished anymore. And Jesus will always defend you. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord, okay? The word propitiation means a sacrifice that dwarfs the anger of a deity. Jesus has removed all the wrath of God against you because of his sacrifice. Once and for all time. Can you say? All time, okay? Here's another clarification, okay, just for us to understand. I know there are Catholics here, and I need you to understand what you believe, okay? And we will look at it through the scriptures. This is where most of us stand today. The Lord's Supper or communion, according to the word of our Lord, is just a memorial of a past event. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He wants us to remember what he did. But that remembrance has no meritorious or sacred uh, effect. Because it's just a memorial of what he has done. The benefits of Christ's death, forgiveness of sins, and reconciliation with God are not received through such a ritual of remembrance according to the scriptures, but are received by the Christian believer through personal confession of sins to God and faith in his promises and in Christ's intercessory work. In other words, the word of God is teaching, I don't need to be in a mess for me to be forgiven. Because I can come to God, confess my sins, and the word of God says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Okay? And forgiveness is received even without the Mass. 
It is a direct relationship with God. Amen? Let's continue on. Here are the scriptures. Can we read this together? If we confess our sins, and the context shows to God, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So when does God forgive us? When we confess our sins to, to God. An example here is in Psalm. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not over up my iniquity. Then I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So to whom do we confess our sins? To God. Why? Because it was God whom we offended. And therefore we need to come to him and ask his forgiveness. Do you understand that? God doesn't need a representative because God is always there, present with you all the time. That's why if you confess your sins to him, he will forgive you and cleanse you right there and then of all your sins. Amen? Here's another thing. Again, the intercessory work of Christ that applies the benefits of his death on the cross, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, eternal servant, to the life of the Christian. What applies the benefits of Christ's work is our faith in Christ here, okay? And his intercessory work. His intercession for us ensures you will always receive the benefits of his death because he is interceding for you, okay? That's why he said, Whenever we sin, we have an advocate, and that advocate ensures that your sins will be forgiven. Jesus alone has the right to ensure your forgiveness because he gave his life for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, okay? Here's another thing. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who God got to because he always lives to intercede for them. And we have seen that a while ago. Again, he's interceding for us. That's why our sins are forgiven because of his intercession amen not because of a ritual but because of his intercession we are assured of his forgiveness and we receive that forgiveness because he is interceding for us every time we come to god amen and of course there's only one mediator because he gave his life as a ransom for all of us the Christian believer receives these benefits of Christ's death and intercession by virtue of his union with him, which was affected by his faith in him in the beginning and not through the external ritual like the Mass, okay? I respect the belief of the Catholic Church, okay? But I need to be clear where there is now a difference between what Scripture teaches and what the Magisterium teaches, okay? Here it is. You were also united with Christ. And where you united with Christ, you received the Holy Spirit as the seal, the assurance of your eternal salvation. Okay? In Him, because of your union with Christ, that union ensures you that you will have redemption and the forgiveness of your sins. So it's not an external ritual that brings forgiveness to us. It is our union with Christ that brings forgiveness to us. And the intercession work of Christ ensures that forgiveness will always be done to us. Amen? Okay? Forgiveness is in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished. Can you say lavish? Grace. Grace means undeserved favor given to a sinner. You don't deserve that. Amen? God has lavished grace, which means, what's lavish? In Tagalog, lavish, lavish. More than you ever need. God has given you more grace that you're going to have even sin because of Jesus Christ. And your union with Him ensures your forgiveness and your eternal salvation. Okay? Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins proclaimed to you. Through Him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. The moment of faith sets you free from all sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Amen? Just a point of clarification, but I want you to reflect on that one. Okay, I'm not saying, okay, forget about the sacrifice of the Mass. That's okay. You can continue to attend the Mass. There's no problem with that. What we're trying to clarify is the concept behind the Mass and the teaching of the Word of God. That we receive the forgiveness of sins, not because of a ritual, but because of Christ's work of intercession, because of our union with Christ and because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Can you bow down in prayer? I know you may be struggling with guilt in your life, but I want you to know that the resurrection of Christ assures you 
that he always lives to intercede for you. That he is sitting at the right hand of the Father for you to ensure that your salvation will always be there. Amen? But please don't use this as an excuse to continue sinning because there will be consequences if you continue sinning. God, your Father, will love you enough to discipline you. Amen? And so please try to avoid the disciplines of God because they are very painful. God wants us to love Him and obey Him because He deserves all that love. Amen? Are you struggling with guilt in your life? This message reminds you the blood of Jesus has made you acceptable to God and assures you of forgiveness all the time. Just come back to Him. You don't have to explain. You don't have to make drama. When He sees you coming to Him, forgiveness is already there. Even before you speak, forgiveness is already being given to you. Amen? Hindi pahirapan ang pagpapatawad ng Diyos. Can you come to God and say, Father, I thank you for loving me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for being my eternal Savior. I thank you that because of your death on the cross, I am assured of constant forgiveness, that whenever I confess my sin, forgiveness will always be there, because you always intercede for me. And I thank you, Father, for giving me the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess to you all my sins. I admit, Lord, I have sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me. And I thank you that forgiveness will never run out. Because your grace is lavished on me. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love for me. I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to live in condemnation and guilt. Because you paid it all. And you want me to live in peace because of what Jesus has done for me. My ever faithful defense lawyer will always stand up for me every time I sin to ensure my eternal salvation. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I receive you as my Savior and Lord if I have not done so. Today, Lord, I surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus, my Savior. Come into my life. You are the only one who can save me. And I thank you for your promise of salvation. I thank you, Father. And I bless your name forever. In Jesus' name, amen.